Good afternoon. Thousands of requests came to Father Coughlin's desk this week asking him to repeat last Sunday's discourse. While this is impractical, nevertheless, the first few minutes of today's broadcast will condense last Sunday's address for the benefit of those who found it inconvenient at that time to listen. The second part of today's speech will throw enlightenment upon the subject of the Treaty of Versailles and the League of Nations, which are intimately woven into the problem of war. Possibly you are interested in obtaining the past 13 addresses as well as the one about to be delivered. This is your last opportunity to acquire the book containing all these addresses. Write directly to Father Coughlin this week. And now, here is Father Coughlin. Where can I obtain profitable work, asks the laborer. How can I save my farm and sell the fruits of my toil at a profit, questions the farmer. How is it possible to procure security for my children, is the worry of every parent. My friends, these should be questions of prime concern. Unfortunately, however, the mind of America is concentrated upon European affairs in general, and in particular, upon the stark probability of our engaging in war. That we are so inordinately concerned with Europe and its dictators, its aggressors, and its imperialistic plunderbunds is lamentable. It means that we have permitted ourselves to become putty in the hands of the propagandists. It means that we have forgotten why our ancestors fled from the unbearable hardships imposed upon them in England, Ireland, France, Poland, Germany, Italy, and every other country abroad. And possibly it means that we are losing our patriotic appreciation for those stalwart men who rallied round George Washington, who suffered at Valley Forge, who risked their lives to establish a new country with new ideals independent of European intrigues and oppressions. And above all, it means that we have permitted ourselves to be distracted from solving the pressing problems of our national depression. Meanwhile, we grow very indignant at the mere mention of the phrase unjust aggressor, forgetting that 30 million Americans are victims of local aggressors. We wax very idealistic at the sound of the word democracy, forgetful that if we engage in a foreign war, there will be no more American Constitution. As a preface to the remarks I am about to make, let me state that no real American should extend any support or favor towards either Nazism or Communism. These forms of government are totally foreign to our concept. Furthermore, insofar as we Americans do not profess the doctrines of imperialism, insofar as our nation was established in direct opposition to British imperialism, we entertain no fondness for that form of government. Consequently, even though President Roosevelt's commendable peace efforts failed, we are not prepared to assist Germany or Russia or imperialistic France and England in their European wars. All of them have been unjust aggressors in the strict meaning of the word. 
None of them are democracies or republics in the American meaning of the word. As for Germany and Soviet Russia, no one whose opinion is valued disputes the charge of unjust aggressor to these governments. As for Great Britain, all Americans are not in agreement. Many deny that Great Britain has been an unjust aggressor. Others affirm it. Permit me to remind you that Great Britain has been and still is an unjust aggressor. As such, she is not deserving of the expenditure of one American boy's life. How did England acquire her far-flung colonies? By sword and conquest. As far back as the year 1172, nearly 800 years ago, Great Britain began to play the role of the unjust aggressor against Ireland. In the year 1795, when the Irish people endeavored to emulate what our founding fathers accomplished in 1776, history records that the English troops slaughtered 160,000 sons of Erin in the name of aggression. In 1916, and again in 1919, England sent her black and tan troops throughout Ireland to encroach upon the liberties of thousands and thousands of innocent, defenseless citizens who were deprived of their homes, their property, and oftentimes their lives in the name of aggression. Almost to this present year, Britain kept the yoke of oppression firmly fixed upon more than three million Irish people in the name of aggression. And there was no publicity concerning that. Following the seizure of Ireland, Scotland and Wales succumbed to the unjust aggressors operating from London. Territory after territory fell within the orbit of the British Empire, not through purchase, but through the force of arms. Until today, Approximately one-fourth of the entire world is British-owned and British-dominated. And this, then, is the empire which is clamoring about unjust aggression, an empire which is paraded before us as a democracy, an empire that insists upon others, ceasing their unjust aggressions while she holds fast to India, to Egypt, and to parts of Ireland, and to the unpaid billions which we Americans loaned her. Not so long ago, Italy was thoroughly condemned for its unjust aggression against the Ethiopian people. No one in America defends the Italian policy in that instance. But how many of our excited population realize that in 1920, both the Imperial Republic of France, together with Imperial Britain, signed an agreement with Italy to encroach upon the territory of Ethiopia. The agreement read that if and when Ethiopia was conquered, the railroad leading from the capital of French Somaliland to the capital of Ethiopia was be 
succeeding to France. And that the territory around Lake Tana in Ethiopia was to be given to Great Britain. Italy's share was the land itself. These are the facts of the Ethiopian aggression. Facts which indicate that Italy alone was not the unjust aggressor. Some Americans maintain that the United States is likewise an empire because of its aggressions in Cuba and in the Philippines. Following 1898, what was our attitude towards Cuba? We expended men, money, and energy to modernize, at least in part, Cuba, and to restore it to the people to whom it belonged. That was our identical attitude towards the people of the Philippines. Our republic has never been an imperialism by which we won at the point of a bayonet vast territories and then held them to exploit the people resident there for our commercial benefit. What business then have we Americans taking sides with such an unjust aggressor? now that Britain fears the dissolution of her ill-gotten empire. As for Europe, it is still Europe. Its entire history has been a history of aggression. Following each hateful war, European diplomats gathered round the council table. The victors dictated a peace treaty which the vanquished were forced to sign, a peace treaty which in every instance proved to be another scrap of paper. Not one international document terminating a European war has been honored by its signatory. Great Britain and France knew this diplomatic history of Europe. They knew how, how all its peace treaties had terminated in failure upon failure. Therefore, they determined to establish a police force following the World War, a police force known as the League of Nations, whose main objective was to enforce the injustices incorporated at Versailles. With this knowledge, who therefore entertained the thought that the Treaty of Versailles would be honored? Was not its chief objective the dismemberment of the German Empire? Did it not impose a fine of $57 billion payable in gold upon a penniless people from whose treasuries there had been removed a last ounce of gold? Did it not shackle the German people to the pillar of oppression when it virtually forbade them to trade with other nations? Did it not despoil Germany of all her colonies and in a spirit of revenge and barbarism instead of peace and humanity, was not the Treaty of Versailles instrumental in removing more than a million milk cows upon which depended the little children of Germany for their food? What did these children do? Certainly, Germany signed the Treaty of Versailles because there was no alternative. A treaty that will go down in history as the most inhuman aggression ever committed against any people in the entire history of the civilized world. An aggression which was not aimed at the Kaiser, 
at those who were responsible for Germany's participation in the World War, but aimed at the poor, victimized people and children who remain behind when the malefactors had fled in safety. When we therefore become aroused at the mention of the word aggression, what aggression equals in its cruelty, its injustice, and its insanity? The aggression perpetrated by the Treaty of Versailles. The majority of historians recognized, even at the time of its composition 20 years ago, that it was the breeding ground for more aggressions and for another war. Twenty years have passed, and behold, those who were the unjust aggressors at the peace table, particularly Britain and France, are now loudest in advertising to the world the unjust aggressions of Germany and Italy according to their theories any nation which desires England and France to surrender their ill-gotten goods or to restore their ill-gotten colonies is an aggressor Oh, the sacred status quo must not be disturbed, even though it runs foul of the law of self-preservation. There are other reasons which escape the notice of most persons, which explains why Europe has been a constant battleground throughout the centuries. Reasons explaining why the territory of Poland has been partitioned and repartitioned. Why Alsace-Lorraine has been an international football. Why the Balkans have been a constant powder keg of revolution. Why European nations for more than 200 years expended more money upon arms, munitions and war than upon peace and prosperity. Consider these facts. The population of Europe comprises approximately 425 million persons. They are crammed into a little territory practically equivalent in area to the states of Texas and Oklahoma combined. The majority of Europeans is forced to dwell upon land which is totally unproductive of many commodities such as cotton. Their struggle for life always has been a struggle which we Americans in no wise appreciate. We, with our vast expanse of territory, our flowing fields of grain, our well-equipped factories and sources of natural wealth. Is it any wonder that 425 million persons constantly cry for more territory? constantly demand expansion and the right to live? Is it any wonder why the have-not nations constantly have had recourse to arms against the have nations, especially when unsound peace treaties and wicked programs of economy were conceived to starve the masses and prosper the few. Keeping these thoughts in mind, is it not evident that Europe's problems are primarily economic problems? The struggle therefore impending in Europe today is not based so much upon ideologies of government as upon economics. Positively, there can be no lasting settlement and peace for Europe until the European nations themselves are willing to break down the economic barriers by which the haves impose economic restrictions upon the have-nots. 
I repeat, therefore, that the problem of peace in Europe is primarily an economic problem. It is impossible for 425 million people to subsist in contentment penned up in quarters no larger than Texas and Oklahoma and not one half so fertile and productive. That is the reason why every generation of Europe's have-not and nations have risen up in protest against the subjugation imposed upon them by the victors in the previous war. And that same reason will obtain as long as Europe is Europe, as long as the present economy predominates. For ages, the history of Europe has been a history of unjust aggressions. Wherefore, the cry of unjust aggressor raised today is nothing new. It was raised in the days of the Kaiser Wilhelm II. It was on the lips of the Frenchman in the days of Napoleon Bonaparte. It was the same cry which impelled Charles V in the 14th century to reduce the peoples of Europe under his sole sovereign rule. Being advised of this, why should we Americans of this generation be deceived by a catchword when it is so evident that Europe can never have peace as long as it protects its age-old economy of might and oppression, and as long as that economy is founded upon gold. No wonder there is unrest in Europe today. Both Great Britain and France, who have dominated European trade for centuries, have insisted that commerce be carried on through the transfer of gold. The have-not nations, lacking gold, are compelled either to submit to exploitation, or to starve, or to form alliances against their economic aggressors. Supposing the United States of America were divided into 48 nations. Supposing the people of Iowa, or Kansas, or Nebraska, where there is no gold, were forced to trade with the people of Illinois, or Kentucky, or New York, on the basis of gold, or else starve. Would they be content? That is absolutely the parallel imposed upon the majority of European nations today by France and England and the United States in whose coffers three-fourths of the commercial gold of all the world is hidden. While Mussolini and Hitler are engaged in their recent territorial aggressions, the financial aggression perpetrated by the gold-hoarding nations has done more to breed wars and unrest among the European nations which lack both colonies and gold, than have any other factor. It is true we Americans do not like the dictatorial forms of government in Germany, in Italy, and elsewhere. We prefer our Republican form of government. Nevertheless, it is time for us to recognize that the advertised opposition to the fascist nations is not so much related to the forms of government which they sustain as to the fact that the warmongers in America, in England, and in France are more concerned about the prospect of the gold-lacking nations combining against the gold-hoarding nations. Opposition to them 
only because of their political ideologies is pure propaganda. Basically, the disturbances in Europe are more than political. They are economic and financial. Those who endeavor to tell us they are only political are either unmindful of the facts which I have cited or are accomplices trying to deceive the American people to perpetuate the poverty, the exploitation, and the misery which an immoral system of finance and economy has foisted upon every nation of the old world the same system which fails to abolish the depression in the new world. If America goes to war, the outcome will be no different than that following the world war. All propaganda will advertise that we are virtuous in helping to save democracy. But the truth is, we are helping to perpetuate the power of the international bankers. Since the year 1694, when the privately owned Bank of England was established, its owners gradually gained domination over the destinies of Europe and the monopoly of industry. But most importantly, this bank and the other central, privately owned banks throughout Europe established gold as the medium of international trade. And as a result, nations without gold were practically outlawed. Always Great Britain has been successful in getting other people to fight her wars and protect the fruits of our age-old gold policy of aggression. Therefore, Americans, Great Britain will defend her possessions today and tomorrow until the last doughboy is dead. It is almost ludicrous to find that we Americans are more anxious to engage in Europe's chronic wars, to defend the status quo of iniquity and oppression than are our neighbors to the north in Canada. Recently, it was indicated by Mr. Mackenzie King, the Prime Minister of Canada, that his nation would hold aloof from European military entanglements. Canada said through him that Canada was at a loss to understand why it should be necessary every 20 years for the youth of that country to sacrifice their lives to help settle the chronic quarrels of Europe. Canada, a colony of Great Britain. And moreover, spokesmen from many European nations, spokesmen for the people, if not for the government, have bluntly intimated that if there is warmongering being bred in this world, it originates on this side of the Atlantic. Our nation is a giant in territory compared to pygmy Europe. Our population is small compared to the large masses of people who are huddled together from Moscow to Madrid. Our natural resources are infinitely superior to those of the old land. Our constitutional form of government, our superior training in mechanics, and our well-trained executives are without a doubt the finest in the modern world. But despite all that, 
we have 12 million unemployed, 22 million on the dole, more than one third of our population living below the bare standard of existence, and 16 billion dollars of this lurid gold buried at Fort Knox, Kentucky. Oh, shall we who will not use this gold to rectify our economic conditions at home, engage in a world war to starve out of existence those who have no gold abroad? Shall we be duped by the international bankers to preserve their status quo, which literally drains the lifeblood from India, from Africa, from every continent. Which literally drains the lifeblood from India, from Africa, from every colony, to maintain an oligarchy of wealth living in our palaces and force the masses to live in their hovels. Ladies and gentlemen, my criticism is in no wise leveled against the people of England and France whom I deeply respect and with whom I sincerely sympathize. It is intended only for those who have exploited them in their countries as we have been exploited in ours. All peoples want peace. Peace can come only with justice for all. And justice can flourish only when men and women of every country are permitted to live and earn their bread free from the artificial impediment of gold controlled by the private individuals throughout the world. Therefore, if there needs be talk of war, let us in America organize our forces to make war upon this same oligarchy of gold which has closed our factories, confiscated our farms, bred class hatred in the hearts of our citizens. But let us do it in a determined, peaceful, American and intelligent man. Above all, my friends, be not deceived by the mirage of glowing words which pictures the blessedness of social reform or the charity which begins abroad and closes its eyes to the clamoring needs at home. Be not deceived by the fictitious appeals to democracy, which exists nowhere in all the world, as it does here under our Republican form of government in the United States. All oh, be clear-headed, practical men and women capable of facing facts as you find them, capable of judging reformers, internationalists, and warmongers in the scale of truth and of results, rather than in the scales of propaganda and promises. Once the European chancelleries are notified through the passage of a neutrality act, that we in America refuse to supply men, munitions, and money to fight their ever-recurring wars, 
Then and not until then will Chamberlain, Delage, Mussolini, Hitler and Stalin sit down at a common table to discuss their common needs for the purpose of arriving at an agreeable peace and of abandoning the fiction of a forceful gold aggression. If history has taught us one important lesson, it is this. European wars never settled anything, and never will settle anything, as long as they are conducted upon the basis of sustaining the status quo of exploitation. History also has taught us that the peace treaties which concluded every European war were notorious for their force and notable for their lack of justice. That is why they've all been scraps of paper as they should be scraps of paper. That is why they've been breeders of bigger and better wars. In 1914, European diplomats who were puppets of the oligarchs of wealth sounded the trumpets of patriotism and beat the drums of war But in 1914, it was well known that the victims of war, for the most part, would be the young men who fought in the trenches. In 1939, there is not the same readiness to declare war on the part of the diplomats or of their financial masters. All the oligarchs in London, Paris, Berlin, Rome, and Moscow, and in every other capital are aware that the 1939 style of front trenches will be their palaces and their front lawns, upon which destruction will rain down from bombing planes. Destruction with its poison gas and disease germs. Destruction not for the young men in the trenches, but for the diplomats, the aristocrats, and the financial oligarchs who support economic aggression and create wars and use the youth of the nation as cannon fodder. To summarize, therefore, what I have said, remember what a small portion of this world Europe is. What a tremendous population lives upon its soil. What a perpetual struggle for existence is necessitated by reason of an economic system which is maintained to protect the great empires which with bayonet and gun and gold conquered more than one quarter of the territory of the world. Remember that the gold nations insist that trade be carried on through the medium of that instrument. Remember the law of self-preservation which from time immemorial will always agitate the oppressed to rise in rebellion. As much as we dislike Hitler and his persecutions, as much as we detest Stalin and his atheism, As much as we are out of tune with England and France and their imperialism, which subjugates more than 400 million people in Asia, we Americans of this generation are convinced that our place is in America. We are determined that it is our business to fashion our foreign policy which will keep us absolutely free from European and Asiatic entanglements. Unfortunately, we are not well instructed regarding the unjust aggressions recently enacted in Asia. We are prone to believe that Japan, for example, is alone guilty of territorial brigandage. But pause. Have we already forgotten the communist, nationalist, civil war 
fought on Chinese soil uninterruptedly between 1920 and 1936, the radio, press, and cinema remain silent to a considerable degree on this occasion. They did not inform the American public how Soviet Russia, during these 16 recent years, was instrumental in robbing 9,720,000 square miles from China and subjugating a population of over 170 million persons. Nor were we told how 20 million citizens of China, most of them non-combatants, were either slaughtered or starved to death as a result of an unjust aggression created by the efforts of the Moscow government to impose its atheism and Bolshevism upon the Chinese people? Do we Americans comprehend that this Soviet seizure in China represented a territory practically three times the size of the United States? Did our federal government protest test between the years 1932 and 36, when this tragedy, this unjust aggression was being perpetrated, it did not. Oh, probably because our present administration recognizes Soviet Russia and extends its right hand of friendship to a government which not according to my figures, but according to the figures printed in our own federal records, massacred 20,400,000 Christians? Probably. That is the friendship and is the reason for silence on the matter of this Bolshevik aggression. Oh, there are other historical facts of which we Americans perchance are ignorant. In some quarters, the Santa Claus story of our participation in the World War to save democracy is still believed. However, the accurate factual history is disclosed in an official government document cablegrammed by the American ambassador, Walter Page of London, to our Secretary of State on March 5, 1917, a document registered in the Department of State under the number of 5794M45644. It's too lengthy to read in full during this broadcast. Next week, it will be printed verbatim in Social Justice magazine. But the point is this. The document informed the Secretary of State that if we did not throw our resources against Germany and the Central Powers, the gold of the world would fall into German hands, that the European financial system would crash, and that the money which our local international financiers had invested in England and France would be lost. Referring directly and indirectly to these things, Ambassador Page insisted that America should go to war to save the credit of England and France, that the American government, you taxpayers, should extend more loans to protect the investments of the internationalists and support an unsound system of economy. As a result of our entrance into the war, we would reap untold profits, so Mr. Page predicted. All oh, profits for whom? For the men who died in the trenches for the orphans who are sent wandering over the face of the earth, for the maimed victims of gas, shrapnel, and those who came back to dwell amongst us as paupers, as joblets, as 
members of the WPA. Profits for whom? Mr. Page. Profits for the international bankers who already invested in the war. A war fought amongst themselves. A war which we common people thought we were fighting for the preservation of democracy. A war which was really a contest for supremacy in the financial world. That is not a rhetoric. The reliability of this information is established in an official document now in the possession of the United States government and available for everyone in this audience to read, even for those of you who firmly entertained the fairy story that we fought to make the world safe for democracy. And it is also confirmed by a second government document in a decoded message written the same day, March 5th, 1917, which Ambassador Page sent to President Wilson with these words, quotation, Great Britain and France must have a credit in the United States which will be large enough to prevent the collapse of world trade and the whole financial structure of Europe, unquote. Do you appreciate what these words mean? Make the world safe for democracy. That meant that you laborers who are paid less than living wages. And you farmers who were forced to follow your plow at a loss. You patriots who thought you were doing something fine for the common men of Europe were inveigled and seduced into a war to save the rotten financial structure of a decadent continent. A financial structure that was starving 425 million persons. In view of such official documents now brought to light after 20 years, it is time for the American public to abandon its sentimental drivel of a democratic front and recapture its sanity together with its policy of no foreign entanglements. And failing this, we shall be led like sheep to the slaughter by the Judas goat of high finance. And our children, 20 years hence, will have access to government files to read of our deception in 1939, as today we read of our father's deception 22 years ago. I have often spoken to you about the injustices of the Treaty of Versailles. However, I believe one salient point has been omitted. I fail to remind you that President Wilson who sat in with Clemenceau, Lloyd George, and the European schemers had no constitutional authority to sign the treaty. Are you aware, my American fellow citizens, that upon Mr. Wilson's return to America, the United States Senate in 1920 refused absolutely to accept the Treaty of Versailles? Are you aware that the Versailles document was never honored by the American people, but was officially repudiated by our Senate? Possibly millions in this audience labor under the delusion that we Americans legally accepted that peace treaty. The fact, therefore, is, 20 years ago, we repudiated it. Today, Read the headlines. Soviet Russia is preparing to join forces with England and France to perpetuate the status quo of the Versailles Treaty, which they brought into existence. Why then should we be interested with Soviet Russia at this late 
state in sending money, munitions, and men to Europe to support a peace treaty which, from the very first instant, Americans recognized as unjust and which, from the very outset, our Senate refused to accept. If its signatories in Europe, particularly Great Britain and France and Russia, are interested in waging war to uphold the Treaty of Versailles, which they signed, if they are interested in preserving the status quo of injustice, which resulted from it, that is their business. It's none of ours. My friends, following the year 1920, groups of internationalists began to agitate for our government and people to join the League of Nations. Of course you are aware why the League of Nations was brought into existence. It was supposed to be the police force used to protect the Treaty of Versailles and its ill-gotten spoils. To confirm that statement, permit me to quote the late Robert Lansing, former Secretary of State. On May 8, 1919, Mr. Lansing was in receipt of a message from William Bullitt then operating in Europe for our government. Partly basing his information on Mr. Bullitt's report, Secretary Lansing maintained that the Peace Treaty of Versailles was unjust and added that the League of Nations as now constituted will be the prey of greed and intrigue, for it is called upon to stamp as just that which is unjust, unquote. Nineteen years have passed since the Senate repudiated the Treaty of Versailles and refused to participate in the League of Nations because the whole affair was crimsoned with injustice from the outset. Nineteen years have passed, and what is happening? It seems today that the philosophic successors of President Wilson regret that the United States Senate neither signed the peace treaty nor became a member of the League of Nations. And it seems that our American warmongers have cast to the winds the constitutional decision of the people and are endeavoring to force us into a war for the same purposes that Ambassador Page in the first instance indicated to President Wilson. Once more, say they, let us save the international bankers. Once more, let us send our sons over to become cannon fodder for those who exploit 425 million persons. My friends, be not deceived by all this propaganda. No League of Nations proposal will be submitted to us, but in its stead, a neutrality act containing the cash and carry program shall be proposed for passage. And if that portion of the Neutrality Act carries the cash and carry program, already we have entered into European entanglements. Already we can prepare to say farewell to the boys, to the cannon fodder of the internationalists. My friends, our objective is to have peace with justice, the watchword of His Holiness, Pope Pius XII. Let us have peace, but let us recognize that there can be none of it if we help in sustaining the injustices which were incorporated in European diplomacy. At this point, permit me to applaud Bishop John A. 
Duffy of Buffalo, New York, who recently said, quotations, one almost loses all control of himself when discussing the possibility of identifying ourselves even in a remote degree with communistic Russia. I say publicly here and now that if the United States ever joined in a foreign war on the side of Soviet Russia, I would advise every Catholic boy in the United States to refuse to serve. God bless Bishop Duffy for this heroic statement. And may God inspire the people of this nation who hate atheism and abhor Nazism from participating in even the remotest degree in the military activities of country which profess these heresies. For my own self, I should prefer the dishonor of a dungeon or of a concentration camp to assist even remotely in fighting on the side of Soviet Russia. Perhaps, my friends, in making such statements, we depend too much upon ourselves. Perhaps we do not turn to God in this emergency as we should for guidance and help. Oh, be you Catholic or Protestant, I feel it my duty at this moment to remind you that the month of May long since has been set aside to honor the mother of the Prince of Peace. She, the most sorrowful mother, witnessed the most heinous injustice ever perpetrated against a son. Call upon her in this hour of need to protect our sons and save them from the crucifixion of war. She, the most sorrowful mother, sounded the depths of every worry experienced by all the mothers of the world. In this hour of need, beseech her to petition the Prince of Peace to preserve our mother's hearts from the tortures which she herself suffered beneath Calvary's cross. Of old, her boy was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Of old, her boy was transfixed upon a cross by those who protected the money changers in the temple. There she stands. The mother of the human race. The mother of the victim of Calvary. As she beholds another breed of internationalists selling her other sons for 30 pieces of silver to appease the wrath of the money changers and satisfy their greed. O oh, mother of the word incarnate, hear our prayers. Thy son, O oh Mary, was guiltless all through life, while we, his brothers, are filled with sin. Wherefore, if the crown of thorns have pressed our brow, if the scourge of depression has racked our bodies, if the nails of want have fastened us to the cross of poverty, these things we deserve. Oh, but sweet mother of the human race, we still remember the story of the repentant thief on Calvary's hill. With sorrowful hearts we turn at this late hour to thy beloved son. Oh, surely, if your pure lips speak the word, he will save us from war. If thou wilt speak for us, we know that he will turn to us and say this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. My friends, in the name of Christ, for whom we live and for whom we are prepared to die rather than serve in the army of atheism against him, let us petition the Prince of Peace 
through the lips of his blessed mother to spare the youth of America and our mothers too from the cross which the Caiaphases and Annases are building for their destruction. God bless you and save you. And I shall be happy to mail you this afternoon's address at your request. Over these same stations next Sunday afternoon, Father Coughlin's voice will be heard. As you know, daylight saving time begins next Sunday in many sections of the country. Please be advised of this. Our program next Sunday will originate at Detroit at the same time, 4 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Local announcers will confer a favor upon us if at the end of today's presentation they will advise their respective audiences the exact hour Father Coughlin will be heard next Sunday. This is Franklin Mitchell bidding you good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, we've presented the regular Sunday afternoon address of Father Charles E. Coughlin from Royal Oak, Michigan. The thoughts and opinions contained in this address were entirely those of the speaker and do not necessarily...